Guys, we're building up to Christmas. What an incredible time of year it is. And I have a pre-Christmas message that will overflow into Christmas. So if you hear the first part today, uh, and uh, you don't hear the, and you hear the second part next week, it'll make a whole bunch more sense. So those people who aren't here because of whatever reason, weather or holidays, whatever, they need to watch this to be able to set the scene for what I want to speak about next week. I want to talk about the perspective that we have of Christmas is determined by the perspective that we have of Jesus. Your view or vision of Jesus will determine an awful lot about you, about your Christian experience, about where you're going in your Christian life. So you've got to get people an accurate view of who Jesus is. Now, if you were just to look at Christmas, you could be like a whole bunch of people who have the gentle Jesus kind of Christmas view of Jesus. There he is, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, lying in a cradle, and uh, indeed that is who he is, but it's only a very small portion of who he is. And these people, for many, that's the only view that they have. They go through their entire lives with one view of Jesus, that he's a little baby in the manger. Or some people may add a little bit onto that and say, the, see the Easter Jesus. The Easter Jesus is the Jesus who hung upon a cross, who was once in a manger, lived his life, and then hung upon a cross. And they have the second view of Jesus, which is the dead Jesus. The shame, poor Jesus. They killed him. They beat him up. They stuck a crown of thorns. And man, poor Jesus. And so between these two things, we have the Jesus of the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and the dead Jesus hanging upon a cross. Some people, sadly, that's the only view that they have of who Jesus is. Well, here's the good news. There's a whole bunch more. Scripture is just so full. And Chad and Shani will, will, will affirm what I'm saying. And anybody who's read their Bibles will know and affirm that the prophets spoke about Jesus. The, the pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament are just phenomenal. Jesus is all over the place in Scripture. We just got to look for him and find him. Well, I have found a picture of Jesus that I thought would be just a one-off hit, and I thought I'd talk to you about this, but it's going to turn into a three-part series this week, next week, and then probably New Year's Day, we're going to do the third part of it. It's the, the roaring lion of Jesus, because I want to read a passage to you that you'll find at the end of the book of Genesis. Genesis is an intriguing book. It's the beginning of time. There's some of the great patriarchs of history that are down there, and they have all got a, a role to play, but everything, I mean, huh, everything just points to the wonder of who Jesus is. But before we do that, I just want to say this. Your view of Jesus is very, very important, and there's a lot of confusion out there about who Jesus is, what he was like, what his values were, and it's like, well, the real Jesus, please stand up. So we can see who he is and what he is like. And there's this confusion. But in, in John chapter 14, we're not the only ones who suffered that. One of Jesus' disciples, his name was Philip. And he's really confused. He's heard Jesus say that he's the Messiah. He's seen Jesus do the acts that Jesus did to prove who he's, that what he said was true. He's heard Jesus talk about the Father. He's heard Jesus talk about you know, so many, so many, so many things. And yet in his mind, this guy is so confused. So in John chapter 14, he says to Jesus, hey, Jesus, this is Philip speaking. Hey, Jesus, we're really confused. Will you please just show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Just show us the Father. And Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And so what we see in Jesus is so important because what you see in Jesus, you see in the Father. What you see in Jesus will determine how you view the role of the Holy Spirit. But here is an amazing picture of Jesus as per the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, some great heroes. One of them is Joseph. We all know about Joseph. Joseph was the, the guy who started well with a beautiful coat, had it stripped from him, sold his slave to Egypt, spent time in Egypt as a slave, as a servant, as a steward, back into prison. And then ultimately, because of dreams and visions and God's providential plan, he rose out of that situation and became the second hand, second in charge to Egypt, just a little bit under Pharaoh. From zero to hero was the story of his life. But then he had a father whose name was Jacob. 
And in those days, fathers would have a beautiful tradition before they died of calling their children to themselves, and they would, in a sense, prophesy over their kids. They would bring them in individually, and they would talk to each child and say, I believe that this is what you will become. And it was a prophetic word to their kids. Some of the words given were incredible words of blessing, that God is going to bless you, and you're going to be a blessing to the nations, and, and those are great. Some of them weren't so cool. But there was a guy called, called Jude, Judah, who is the father of, the, they get the name Jews from his particular name, and Judah was a son of Jacob, a brother to Joseph. Jacob is about to die. He calls his sons to himself to do his thing. And uh, this is what he says to Judah. He says this. Listen to this. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and he lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? Don't poke the lion, he's saying. Because anybody who pokes Judah is in for trouble. And until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his, it will come out of Judah. That was one of the major tribes of the Jewish nation. And so we see his prophecy here of a lion, but not just a lion, the lion of Judah, but he begins by talking about you are a cub. You're a cub. And so I began to think about this, and I thought, Jesus, I get it, the lion of Judah thing, you know, roaring, being his kingly self like the king of the jungle, and yet he begins as a cub. Isn't that Christmas? The baby is the cub of Judah. He's yet still to become the roaring lion of Judah. At the moment at Christmas, he's just, not just, he is, however, the cub. Out of the lion of Judah comes Jesus, which fulfills a whole bunch of prophecies about who Jesus is. Now, cubs, over a period of time, turn into fully grown adults, don't they? A cub lion will not always be cute. They'll mess with an adult lion. He's ferocious. He's fearless. And he roars. And his roar, if you've ever been camping in a game reserve and you hear the roar of a lion outside of your tent, you, you, you probably, I won't tell you what you're going to do, but you'll probably do that because you'll be very scared. You'll be very nervous because he, he breeds fear. He breeds authority. He, breeds, he brings so many beautiful things to this place. You know you're in his territory. You see, when the lion walks in the room, you'll know he's there. I, I'll tell you a, a real-life example of this. Some years back, I was involved in, in a project of cutting diamonds. And I was like the security guy in charge of this thing. And there was a whole committee of people who, who all thought they were like lions. Their opinion was so important, and they wanted it this way, and they wanted it that way, and they were going to do this with the diamond, and they are going to do that with the diamond. And we spent days deliberating how we're going to cut these big stones. Anyway, one day, a guy by the name of Gabby Tolkovsky arrived on the scene. And Gabby Tolkovsky was about this high. He was the greatest, the best Jewish diamond cutter in the world, and a total authority on how to cut big stones. And we had all been niggling and haggling, and everybody's rivaling with one another to have their will in their way until Tolkovsky walks in the room. <laughs> And you knew that the lion had arrived. <laughs> you knew the lion had arrived because he carried such a presence with him that we all did what you do in the presence of greatness. We just shut up. We just shut up and shivered because he was the one who knew how to do this thing. And we bowed to his greater knowledge, his greater ability, his greater experience. The lion was in the room and we knew it. When the lion gets in the room, he's in you're in his territory, kind of like the lion in the game reserve as well. And so today, I want to paint a picture to you of the baby that lies in the crib as being a cub. He doesn't remain a cub. He is, however, the cub. But he's destined for greatness. He's destined to be who he was and is, the king, the lion of Judah. 
So I want to talk about the roar of Christmas. You know, when you play that game with kids as, a, as babies, and they're trying to learn all the different things that we love to get, teach our kids tricks, hey. So in public, we'll say, so, so Ben, so Ben, what does a sheep say? And we'll go, Bah, and we say, wow, so cool. So, cool. so Ben, what does a, a monkey say? <laughs> you know? So, so Ben, what does a cow say? And he'll say, Bah, no, <laughs> he'll say, moo. You know, he, and then we get a lion. So, Ben, what, is a, what does the lion say? And you go, roar. You see, lions roar. And when we hear the roar that comes out of the cub of Christmas, you get a brand new, real, great revelation of who it is that's lying in that cradle. And that's what I want you to hear today and for the next couple of weeks, the roar of Christmas. You know, we hear the cry of a baby. I've got to tell you, the universe hears the roar of the Lion of Judah. But for us, that's where it begins. Do not be fooled, people. The cub is a king. Now, one thing about lions, as we've already said, is that you know you're in their territory because of the roar, but they are, they're amazing. But they also have enemies. You know, if you watch a National Geographic, there was a great series on TV recently about the war that takes place with their arch, arch enemies, sworn enemies, hyenas. Lions and hyenas hate one another. And hyenas will run in packs. Lions don't need packs. They can deal with these hyenas mainly. And as they beat the hyenas, as they roar, the hyenas tremble. And they personify evil to these hyenas. Kind of like with Jesus and Satan and his demonic powers. When the Lion of Judah roars, people, i got to tell you, Satan and his cronies, they, they tremble. They tremble. I know this because I've read about Mark chapter 5, the demons. When Jesus one day meets a demon-possessed man, and the demon-possessed man has full of thousands of demons. They, they call him legion because he has so many demons in him. And the demons recognize they're in the presence of greatness. So they do what we do when we're in the presence. They just shut up and they just, and they just quivered, a thousand demons, quivered in the presence of the cub Jesus. Because the cub Jesus was just practicing his roar, as cubs do. If you've ever watched The Lion King, one of the cutest parts of The Lion King movie is where, is where Simba's learning, learning how to roar. He's just a little cub. Jesus is learning how to roar on demons. And as he begins to see that the demons see him for who he is, they begin to tremble and they, they begin to plead with Jesus. They say, Dear Jesus, just to be kind to us, send us into that le- those pigs over there. And Jesus, just as a cub, he's still a cub learning how to roar. He commands those demons to leave, and boy, they leave. So even in just practicing his rule, demons flee just when he practices his rule. And then you see how Jesus roars against this thing, our arch enemy called sin. And Jesus roars against sin. But the interesting thing about Jesus' roar against sin is it's exactly that. He's not roaring out against you because you're a sinner. He's roaring again out against sin because he hates what sin does to you. Do not think that sin, it might be fun for a while, but eventually it does you in. And Jesus know that sin, knows that sin damages you. Sin hurts you. And so Jesus roars out against sin. He's not against you. He's against the sin that hurts you and brings you down. Jesus hates sin. He doesn't hate you. In fact, it's true to say that Jesus is for you against your sin. Have a look at that woman that was caught in adultery. There she was, thrown down as a sinner. Jesus said, if the Lord judges her, she's dead. But Jesus didn't judge her according to the law. He drew next to her. He says, I am with you against your sin. I don't like your sin. I don't affirm your sin, but I'm with you against your sin. Go and sin now no more because you are forgiven. That's beautiful. Jesus is with you against your sin, and he roars out against sin. Jesus roars out against sin. Injustice. Man, if there's one thing Jesus hates, <laughs> it's injustice. In John chapter 4, we have Jesus at the temple, and the business people of the town are ripping people off, 
selling offerings at exorbitant prices, ripping off the poor. And Jesus stands there and he looks at this and he says, this is just not right. I can't stand this anymore. And it says he went and he made a whip. He programmed this. It wasn't just a spontaneous act that got up Jesus' nose. He went out there and he made a whip. He made this whip and he came with that whip and he drove those uncouth, injustice-ridden people out of the temple because of what they were doing. If there's one thing Jesus roars against is injustice. And he was just practicing his roar that day at the temple. Jesus roars against, let's take one up here, poverty. In Matthew chapter 14, we hear the roar of Jesus. <laughs> he saw a whole bunch, 5,000 to be exact, people who were hungry. And the roar began to get in his own. He says to his disciples, you've got to feed these people. The roar is coming on. And he's just practicing his roar. And his disciples look and say, Jesus, we haven't got food. He says, feed them. Feed them. And he spoke with such authority. He says, feed them. What have you got amongst you? They said, oh, Jesus, all we've got is a few loaves and a few fish. That'll do. Feed these people. I can't bear to see these people hungry. Feed them. And the disciples heard the roar of Jesus. And he's still just practicing his roar. Then he has another roar. He hates disease, sickness. Cancer, corona, blindness, deafness. Jesus hates it. He hates disease. And when you look at Matthew 20, we see Jesus beginning to rumble his roar when there's two blind men sitting at the gate. And they're crying out. They're saying, Jesus, we can't see you, but your presence is everywhere. We know you're close by. You're the lion. We know that your presence is here because everybody else is silent. And if they aren't silent, they're asking you for stuff. Jesus, will you, will you take notice of us? And the crowd came to this group of people and said, Ah, be quiet, man. Don't you know the lion is here? You need to be quiet. You don't want to, Jesus hasn't got time for you. And Jesus begins to build up his roar. And he says to his disciples, who's calling for me? I can hear a voice, two voices calling for me. And they sort of said, Jesus, don't worry about them. It's just two blind men. They've been sitting at the gate forever. Jesus, don't worry about them. And Jesus says, no, I love those people and I hate disease. And he says, bring them to me. And so very nervously, his disciples go and they bring these two blind men to Jesus and Jesus heals them with great compassion. But the roar in his heart was saying, I hate disease. I hate illness. I hate sickness. And he's just beginning to practice his roar. Then we look how Jesus hates. He hates arrogance. <laughs> oh, man, God hates arrogance. Arrogance. When you think you're better than somebody else. You think you've got all the answers. It's got to be your way or the highway. And Jesus looks at his disciples one day, and there's these children who want to come and see Jesus. And they're arrogant. They said, Jesus, I've got time for you. You're just children. Don't you know your place? Children should be seen and not heard. Get away, children. And Jesus sees this arrogance, and the roar begins to happen. And he's still just practicing his roar. He's coming out of cupship, and he's growing towards kingship. And the roar is beginning to get louder and louder and louder as he hates arrogance. And he says to the disciples, he said, bring those children to me. And he spent time playing with the, the kids. He hates arrogance. And then what about his roar? His roar against corruption. Oh, some people are going to be in a lot of trouble. We may not see it, and they may think that they're getting away with it, but God has eyes and ears and sees, sees everything. And when there's corruption in the country, it's a matter of time, and there's either going to be a rebellion, there's going to be problems, but the corrupt will be seen by God. Don't think they get away with it, people. Do not think, and don't think you get away with it, because corruption is something that is just relative in term. Everybody has an element of corruption. Jesus was particularly hard on the Pharisees. And he says, you're a bunch of whitewashed sepulchers. You're hypocrites. You say one thing and you live another thing. Oh, when I hear that, I'm nervous. Because there's an element of hypocrisy, I think, in pretty much every one of us. 
If we say one thing and we do another thing, I'm always nervous to preach these sermons because now I'm just trying to love them. And one of you is going to catch me out one day. And I know that because we're all in the element. There's an element of hypocrisy in every single one of us. But Jesus hates corruption. And he calls these people out against the evilness of self-righteousness. I've been a whitewashed sepulchre. It says you're like a tomb, all clean and nice and white and whitewashed on the outside. But inside you're just a bunch of dead, corrupt bones. And he's just practicing his rule right now. Jesus hates. I could go on. Let's talk about Jesus' hate towards prejudice. Prejudice. That woman at the well that Jesus met, disciples had gone into town to buy food. When they came back and they saw Jesus, they, it says, the Bible says, they were surprised. And he said, why were they surprised? The scripture is clear about that. The disciples were looking at Jesus and saying, so Jesus, what did you do while we were away? And then they see this woman and they were surprised. And they say, Jesus, you know, what's she doing here? And Jesus said, oh, she and I have been having an awesome conversation about water and living water and all that stuff. Jesus, and he said, they looked at Jesus and said, but Jesus, don't you know she's a Samaritan? She's a woman. She's a sinful woman. Jesus, we've heard of people like her. And Jesus, you shouldn't be hanging around or even talking to people like that. And Jesus begins to roar. He hates, hates prejudice. And they were surprised. People, you'd be surprised too. Who Jesus loves. Let's move on to the big ones. This little cub has been practicing his rule on all these things here. But then one day the cub is coming to maturity and he has to have a rule against this big enemy of death. That's a big one. And the roar comes out as Jesus hangs upon the cross and he's roaring and he cries out with a great roar. It is finished. And the lion apparently dies. He has apparently been killed. But he cries out, it is finished. And he says, God's plan is finished for salvation. God's plan for redemption of mankind. It is finished. It was a victorious cry and a great roar that came from the mouth of Jesus as he died there upon the cross. It is finished. Satan heard this. And he probably misheard it because he probably thought, what did Jesus say? What did he say? What he said, this demon said, was he said, they said, he said, I'm finished. <laughs> and now Satan's saying, nodding his head, saying, yeah, he's finished. He acknowledges he's finished, but he didn't hear right. He should, should have heard, you are finished, Satan. You are finished. I've finished what I need, and now you are finished. But Satan didn't hear that. And I get this picture in my vivid imagination of Satan and the demons in hell all beginning to celebrate. Jesus has said, he's finished. He's finished. Uh uh-uh. He says, it's finished. And as hell begins to celebrate people, they hear an incredible roar that comes out of an empty grave. I'm alive. And I am very well. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O grave, is your victory? Where, O where, oh, death, is your sting, is the way that Paul put it. And I can just picture Jesus mocking death, mocking it. So you think you got me? You're like a sting. You sting once like a bee, and then you're dead. You die yourself. And 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, I think it is, Jesus declares that death is dead. It happened at the cross. As the roar came out of this great, huge, empty tomb, and the roar that said, death is dead. You know, in Genesis 3, verse 15, this is predicted, right back in the beginning of time, third verse of the Bible, third chapter of the Bible, verse 15, it's predicted that one day Jesus will crash and crush the head of Satan, and he will crush it. He will crush it. 
he will crush it. I know this is graphic, but you've got to get that. And at the death of Jesus, when that roar came out of that grave, Satan, where are you? I've got to crush your head. And you could hear the whole world crash as Jesus stood on the head of Satan. Now he's the king. Now he's gone from the cradle to the king. He's been practicing his roar. Now he's ready to rule. You've got to give me a little bit of slack here for some poetic license. If you're a biblical theologian, you may be shivering right now. But uh, the key I want you to hear right now is don't mess with the king. He's the king of Judah. Don't mess with that cub. He's just a kid, but he's also the king. And he's the lion of Judah. Can I continue? I haven't finished yet. Listen to this. Now he's graduated. He's the king. And he still roars today. Let me tell you what Jesus roars again against from heaven. He, he, he roars against hopelessness. He says to those who feel hopeless amongst us from Psalm, Psalm 40, 43, verse 5, he says, put your hope in me. Some people trust in horses. Some people trust in chariots. Don't put your hope in those. Don't put your hope in the hills because the hills are not going to be able to bring hope for. He's against those things because he says, I am your hope. And he's roaring. And if you're trying to find hope in something other than Jesus, Jesus is roaring at you to say, what are you trying to do? Why are you trying to find hope in what they say or what they do? Your hope is going to be in me. Your hope must be in me. Why is your soul so downcast, you who are so darn miserable right now? Why is your hope so downcast? Put your hope in me. God roars. He's not suggesting this. He roars from heaven. Put your hope in me. 1 Corinthians 13 ends with, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. Hope comes second to the end. Is love is the big one. But hope, people, if you're saying, I have no hope, then, then that, that you're in trouble because God will declare where there's no hope, not you. And you may be saying there's no hope, but God's not finished with it yet. There is always, always, always hope when God is put first. If he's not first, you're in trouble. You may scream, shout, pray, and sing about hope. But when he's first, there's always hope in your life. Hope remains. The second thing that he roars from heaven is in the realm of helplessness. Hopelessness and helplessness help hold hands with one another. They kind of go through the whole thing. Psalm 121 talks about the hills are not going to help you. Why do you look to the hills for your help? Your help, God says, come from me, the Lord, the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. Your help comes from me. What about he roars out against fearfulness? We are a fearful generation. We're fearful about everything. We feel about, fearful about the future. We're fearful about failure. We're fearful about the past. We're, fearful, we're scared of the dark. We're, we're scared of everything. We shouldn't be. For those who are fearful about things like guilt and shame, your past life, there's always consequences, but Jesus says, your past life, if it is confessed, is forgiven. It's done. I love what he says in Isaiah 1. He says, though your sins are like scarlet, it is now, they are now as white as snow. Though your sins were red like crimson, they're like wool now. People, if you, if you are still carrying with you the guilt and the shame of stuff that you have done in the past, known or unknown, you better dump it. Because God roars at you. The message of Christmas, the roar of Christmas, he says, it is finished. Your guilt and your shame, they are gone. Some people are fearful about the future. Why don't you try seeking first the kingdom of God? And his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I'm just saying that to you. God roars it at you. What about John 14? Those who are fearful of, and this is a legitimate thing, and I don't want to take away too much from this, the fear of, of, of the grave, the fear of, of, of death, the fear of those things. There's a, something inside of us fears those things because they're unknown to us. If we knew some stuff about them, we would grieve a whole lot differently. 
Grief and death go hand in hand. And we grieve because we think we've lost. You've lost nothing, people. You've lost nothing. Those who you grieve over are still well and truly alive if they love the Lord. You do know that, hey? You do know that. Because as much as naturally we grieve, and that's good, we have to weep, we have to cry, we have to remember, we have to do this. We don't grieve, like Paul says, without a hope. We grieve as those who have a hope in eternity. Jesus said, John 14 says to his disciples, you know, don't worry about it. I've got a place for you. I've got a place for you in heaven. And for those of you who are grieving and fearful of death, Jesus said, don't think about that. I have a place for you in heaven. Man, I could go on, but my time has gone. People, he's the cub at Christmas, but he's the king at the end of the grave. He's the lion of Judah, and we celebrate that. I have one last scripture I want to read to you. As much as that revelation came from the first book of the Bible, I want to turn now to the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, because he's mentioned again, the king, the king, the lion of Judah. Listen as I read. This is John, what he saw in his vision. He said, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scrolls or even look inside it. I wept. And I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lion of Judah from the root of, J- of, of David. The lion of Judah, he is here. He has triumphed over death and of grave, over all these other things we wrote about there. He has triumphed and he is able to open the scroll. He's the king. He's the lion. And he roars at you from heaven. I hope this Christmas time you hear the roar of the lion. Because it's very loud if you'll just listen. I have to close, but I have a word of advice for you, just from me. Um, If everything I've said today is true, what are you going to do? I don't know, but there's one thing I know you need to do. You need to make friends with the lion. (laughs) You don't want to oppose him. You don't want to face him in a dark street. You want to make friends with the lion. I remember sharing with you a while back that I I had a a story as a kid that I loved, and it was the story of a, a slave who, in the Roman times, who, who escaped. And he ran up to the mountains around the town, and he, he was hiding in a cave. And as he came into this cave, he heard something that frightened him terribly. It was the roar of a lion. There was a lion sharing his cave. And he thought, it's either the lion or it's the Romans. Which one am I going to go? I'm dead both ways. So he did the wrong thing. He chose the lion. He said, maybe the lion will feel sorry for me. The Romans are not going to feel sorry for me. They kill escaped slaves. So he snuck into the cave. And the lion was roaring. He was back down and he was roaring. And suddenly this young slave, this kid, saw why the lion was roaring. It wasn't because of him. The lion had his thorn in his paw. And he couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get the thorn out of his foot. And so the kid thinks, I can get the thorn out of his foot. And he said, he gets closer to the lion. The lion roars louder. And he's more frightened, but the kid's determined. And he walks towards the lion. Eventually, he takes the foot of the lion, and he pulls the thorn out. And the lion is quiet. The Romans found them both. They dragged him down into the pit. And they put the lion where he was meant to be. He was meant to be eating slaves. He was in those cruel places where they would throw people into the lion's den. And this lion, too, had escaped. Now he went back to the den. 
And then they thought, well, let's throw the kid in the lion's den as well and watch the lion eat the kid. And when the kid got thrown into the den, the lion recognized him and said, that's my friend. <clears throat> People, you better make friends with the lion. This is a big deal. I sure hope you have. You come to the lion and you, of Judah and you say, I acknowledge you for who you are. I want to be your friend. And that's okay. It's a legitimate thing to be a friend of God. Abraham was, Moses was, you can too. I hope you do that today if you haven't already. Let's pray. <clears throat> God, we stand in awe of you today. Our perception of you as a, as a kid in a crib. It's only one small picture. As a cub growing to become a full, fully-fledged lion, one that roars, is ferocious, protects his family, protects his territory. That's who you are. And I pray today, man, I pray today that we will get this picture of you at Christmas time. I pray, Lord, that we would make friends with you and that's not being facetious. That's not taking it lightheartedly. But to be a friend of Jesus, man, that would be awesome. Thank you for who you are today in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>